Good afternoon, and thanks for joining us for today's webinar, Addressing the Manufacturing Labor Shortage. I'm Brett Bauer, principal and a leader in the firm's manufacturing pro uh, practice, along with Zach Starner, manager with McConley and Asbury. We're also joined by special guest Kent Keller, who's a business advisor specializing in workforce engagement from Mantech. Um, thanks for being with us today, Kent. Thank you for having me. Of course. So many attendees are familiar with Mantech already, but for those maybe who are not, Kent, can you just give us a very quick introduction to what Mantech is? Absolutely. So Mantech is a private nonprofit organization that provides training, consulting, and business referral services to manufacturers in nine counties around South Central Pennsylvania. <clears throat> we celebrate a strong reputation by helping clients solve operational issues with our Six Sigma Lean and Continuous Improvement Training and Consulting Services. But we help other businesses with more than just efficiency and process issues. We offer services in areas like sales and marketing, technology and automation, and workforce, which includes our environmental health and safety training and consulting services. Great, thanks, Kent, appreciate that. And for those of you who don't know, McConley and Asbury is an accounting and business advisory services firm. We have three offices in Camp Hill, Lancaster, and Bloomsburg, Pennsylvania. You can see the wide range of services that we offer across various industries on the screen here. And we also encourage you to go out to our website to learn more. If you've joined us on past webinars, welcome back. If you haven't, our monthly webinar series feature various business topics to keep you updated on what's going on around us. Be sure to check out our website to catch past presentations as well as current information through our blog. For today's webinar, if you have any questions, uh, please submit them through the built-in questions function in the webinar control panel, and we will do our best to answer them either during the webinar or after. And for those of you who are looking for CPE credit today, please keep in mind that there will be three polling questions throughout the presentation. You'll need to answer all three of them in order to get your certificate, which will be emailed a few weeks after the presentation. So today's agenda, we're going to start out by diagnosing the skilled labor gap in manufacturing. Um, just exactly what is that? How did we get here? And then moving on to what is it going to look like in the next five to 10 years? Most of our time is going to be spent in the third bullet point where we're going to look at practical ideas to help minimize the impact on your business. So Zach, can you go ahead and get us started with diagnosing the skilled labor gap? Yeah, thank you, Brett. So what led to the labor shortage? I feel like we'd be remiss if we didn't mention uh, the global pandemic that we just uh, got through and or still going through. Um, you know, that had a significant impact on the workforce with uh, a lot of businesses being shut down for a period of time um, and then having the hardship of trying to, to draw those workers and those employees uh, back to work. Another thing that led to the labor shortage um, is just <clears throat> coming out of high school, uh, you know, there's this push for young adults to, to go out and get a four-year college degree. And, and I think automatically at the high school level, that's shifting um, focus away from uh, trade jobs and skilled labor towards uh, a four-year college education public perception. I think that can be a tough one to try to get young people interested in, in manufacturing jobs as they, they don't necessarily see that as a long-term career. And lastly, an aging... I just inter Zach, you I know, interject there. I'm curious yeah, to hear ahead, about, um, what, why do you think that is? Why do you think the public perception it's just not seeing manufacturing as a good viable career long term. Any thoughts on that? You know, I th I think it stems from j just the idea of the uh, the factory environment. You know, hot, dirty, and, and you know that <clears throat> at, at some facilities that couldn't be the furthest from the truth. Uh, unfortunately, you're always trying to fight that stigma. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, 
I, I saw a survey recently, you know, going along this this idea of public perception in manufacturing, um, which actually was looking at how the manufacturing industry is not viewed as very innovative, and they were thinking that might have something to do with it as well. Um, but the survey actually showed kind of a promising result where from pre-pandemic to post-pandemic, the percent of people who, who think manufacturing as an industry is innovative uh, went up from 39% to 64%. So I, I think it'll be interesting to see if, if that third bullet point, um, if we can't turn that around a little bit and, and change the public perception that you can have a good viable career in manufacturing. Yep, great point, Brett. And our last bullet point for what led to the the labor shortages and aging workforce, um, you know, approximately 45% of uh, the current labor force for manufacturers is uh, over 40. Oh. Yeah, that, that last bullet point too, that's a huge reason for the labor shortage. Um, I saw too, Zach, I don't know if you've seen much with the, the truck drivers uh, running into similar issues with an aging workforce there, but that's impacting our manufacturing clients as well. Um, I saw the average age of a truck driver today is somewhere between 50 and 55. So certainly nearing retirement, and that's going to impact um, our manufacturing clients as well. So what's the tangible impact on manufacturers? You know, I, right off the bat, I think it's missed opportunities in production and sales. Obviously, uh, if the manufacturers don't have the 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 workforce out there, they're they're not going to be manufacturing the goods, and that's in turn going to lead to missed opportunities on sales. I think the other point here to mention, as you'll see in a future slide, th this is going to be a long-term challenge for manufacturers. This isn't something that is going to correct itself overnight, and it's going to be something that they're going to have to be thinking of as a long-term challenge. <clears throat> another another impact of the the labor shortage it's going to result in increased wages and benefit costs for employees. Here in the chart, you can see uh, in October 2021 the average wage for um, someone working in uh, manufacturing was $24.24, and you can see in July of 2022. It's up to 25.07, and I I look for that to continue continue to increase as the gap widens. Um, so obviously that's going to drive uh, significantly tighter margins for our manufacturers. Yeah, and and that's a great point. I know you and I, Zach, as we go out and meet with our clients, um, that's one of the first things we heard last year, just seeing the the shrinking margins because they weren't able to pass around or pass along those increased costs quick enough. Um, I, I, this is just anecdotal, but I'd, I'd be curious if you've seen anything similar. I, I feel like in 2022, as I've been talking with my clients so far, um, they've they've gotten better or quicker at passing along those increased costs, whether it be from labor, as you're showing here, or material costs. So I, I'm hoping, you know, in, in the audit world, we're always a few months behind looking historically at numbers. So I'm hoping when we look at 2022, we'll see that margins are, are getting a little back, a little bit back to normal um, if they're able to pass on those price increases. Yep, that's a great point, Brett. So what's the expected future shortage here? So so off to the right, we'll see there's a there's an expected shortfall of 2.1 million manufacturing jobs by 2030. So how do we get there? <clears throat> so right now we're anticipating 2.5 million jobs, uh, job openings from retirement. And then we're also expecting another 1.5 million jobs as a result of expected growth in the manufacturing field. So now, <clears throat> Obviously, we'll, we're expected by 2030 to, to fill approximately 1.9 million of those positions, but, but that leaves that 2.1 million open. So as a result of that uh, gap, as you would say, or shortfall, there's an expected $1 trillion co cost as a result of not 
not being able to fill those open positions. And that that is a staggering statistic to me. All right, so we are going to go ahead and move to our first polling question. So the question is, which issue is the most disruptive to your business right now? Staffing shortage, supply chain disruptions, inflation, or other? And Kent, as someone who is consulting with a lot of manufacturers here in central PA, um, some of whom are, are probably in this webinar, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts um, as we wait for answers to come in uh, over the next 30 seconds or so. What, what do you expect to see as the number one answer? Uh, I believe it's going to be the workforce shortage. Um, I think that is one that um, this workforce shortage, while it is problematic right now, I think it's one we've been suffering from for more than three decades. So, uh, but you hit the top two. Um, I feel staffing shortage is probably going to take the lead in the end here. There you go. Spot on. Yep. 62% answered staffing shortage. Um, probably while you're on this webinar today. <laughs> so let's go ahead and advance to next slides. All right, Kent, can you go ahead and get us started on some of the more practical tips? I can. And Zach, great numbers. Um, those those numbers are staggering and almost overwhelming um, and thanks for pointing out some of the many reasons why there are you know we're in this you know predicament this this staffing shortage um, most importantly though is the most recent event i think it's the pandemic and that's where we had millions of workers that left the workforce in march of 2020 and now they're back to work and that hiring has had a real negative impact on many manufacturers you're seeing much fewer applicants you're seeing much fewer candidates for positions, it's increasing your labor costs, it's forcing manufacturers to really rethink most aspects of their business, remote working relationships, benefits, compens compensation. Um, many companies have thought about sign-on bonuses if they aren't already doing them, dropping their hiring requirements, increasing starting wages, vacations, discretionary bonuses, all that fun stuff. So. As a manufacturer, what should you be doing to remain ahead of the curve? Let's talk about some of these trends. And I'm gonna hit these three bullet points pretty quick and I'm gonna expand on them in the next several slides. So I want you to get creative in what you're doing. Many of you have heard the definition of insanity and that's doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. Well, I want you to get creative. I want you to think outside the box. I want you to look at some target marketing, targeting your workforce and maybe even some non-traditional uh, workers that you might not have always um, gone out to pursue. And then lastly, I wanna talk about leased and contract employees. And I know this is a been there, done that exercise, but I'm hoping that you'll re revisit these relationships and consider a technology solution. Yep, I said technology, just wait for it. That's my teaser for you to hang in there for the rest of this webinar. Go ahead, Brett. Okay, so I have some pictures here. We're doing some out of the box thinking. I want you to reinvent everything. Your job ads, job descriptions, anything that you consider a branded message. I know quite a few employers that just place an ad somewhere out there on the internet, let it run for weeks and months at a time. I want, I want you to stop doing that. Don't do the same thing over and over again. Don't just repost the job description that the hiring manager just gave you. Rewrite that ad, make it sound interesting, tell a story, make your advertising eye-catching, have it stand out above the rest, make it appealing to your audience. Let's talk about job fairs, instant interviews and referral programs. Do you go to job fairs? Do you go the same, do the same thing every time? Just hand out your applications, direct people to your website? Do something different, be creative. Don't just gather the applications and take them back, hoping to convince a hiring manager to make the time, or worse yet, letting a potential applicant get away. 
you can pre-qualify that candidate in that 30 to 90 second time frame that you have with them, don't let them walk away without a next step. Schedule the interview at the facility, or better yet, set up some type of virtual meeting with another member of your team back at your facility before they leave the job booth or job fair. You have open houses, have them frequently, have them as often as you can, especially if you're trying to hire off shift employees, have them during those off shift hours, make it convenient, do everything you can to get people into your facility. Do instant interviews for candidates to meet certain hiring criteria. You ever do the Disney interviews, scheduling 10, 20 or more candidates for tours, meetings and interviews, and then as the day ends, you make offers to a certain percentage of those candidates. Let's talk about referral programs. You have ones that reward the employee based on the quality of the hire, not the quantity of hires. Do you ever pay out more for experienced positions or higher level jobs? And what are you using for rewards? Are you just putting a few extra dollars in their paycheck that gets taxed? Have you ever considered doing something um, creative? Additional vacation days, tickets to shows or events or concerts. Ever consider trips, vacations, weekend getaways, experiences like skydiving, sunset balloon rides or whitewater rafting. And then let's look at your application. Is it the easiest way to apply for work in your company? Make sure it's as easy as possible. Next slide. Okay, so let's talk about targeting your workforce. I wanna talk about employment branding for just a, a minute. So the big guys are already doing it. Nike, Google, Coca-Cola, Apple, these people are already doing it. But if you wanna become an employer of choice, you need to build your brand. It's just as important to marketing and branding your products and services. So you should have a strategy for employment branding. And some of the basic elements you wanna define is what is your reputation? What's the value proposition? Why should that candidate work for you? And then once you have some of those things worked out, you can create the content and then deploy that content in a branded and consistent fashion. I wanna talk about non-traditional employees now. Because manufacturers tend to require experience or dismiss overly qualified candidates. And a number of employers have successfully reevaluated positions to attract inexperienced and younger workers. After all, these are our, the future of all of our businesses. So consider looking at positions where you can share a job with someone who prefers not to work full-time hours or can't work full-time hours or where you can have a flexible schedule. I've always encouraged Mantec clients to hire for attitude and train for skills. If you find the right person who fits culturally, they can be trained to do the job. They can be trained to do any job. So, and many companies have also re-engaged mature workers who want to continue working into their golden years. Consider retirees who come back in other capacities or take on special projects. There's quick reintegration and onboarding benefits to that relationship, but there's also other positive aspects. Mature workers are often described as more reliable than other generations. They have confidence and often higher self-esteem. And these are two qualities that go very, very far in some manufacturing workplaces. And they have experience. Even if it's not experience in the job they're doing, that experience is very helpful. It can prevent mistakes that inexperienced workers might make. Yeah, I think, I think that's a great point, Kent. Um, I, I feel like I've run into several people who have retired in the last few years, um, maybe accelerated through the pandemic, but many of them aren't looking to completely retire, never work another hour in their life. I know many of them have come back to do some type of part-time work. So I think that's an important point to not overlook that demographic. Absolutely. Okay, let's talk about leased and contracted workforce. I want to talk about temporary employees and temporary agencies for just a, a few minutes here. Many, if not most of you already do this. 
and I've heard all the horror stories and I know the love hate relationship that you have with these vendors. But I want you to ask, I want you to consider working collaboratively with your vendor or vendors. Remember, you're both in this together and you're fighting for the very same scarce resource. We've had and seen success when there's defined onboarding and career pathing. Have you ever considered incentives and rewards for things like retention, loyalty, and performance? Again, work collaboratively with your vendor to come up with strategies and programs that are successful in your business. I want to talk about contracting and outsourcing. Many organizations believe they should do what they do best and outsource everything else. That's a strategy I often see in smaller manufacturers, but it's very successful in mid to larger employers. So organizations will often contract with machinery or equipment or facility maintenance. They'll contract for management of quality functions or outsource sales management functions. They'll contract for services to take care of AP and AR, or they'll find consultants to lead special projects like continuous improvement, equipment upgrades and installations. So I challenge you to look hard at your hard to fill positions or hard to retain positions and identify those opportunities. If you don't need a quality manager, a sales manager and an accounting manager all the time, why employ them to start with? So organizations like McConley um, and Asbury, Brett and Zach, they know people, Mantech knows people, we can help you to find and refer experts to your business to help you with those things. I wanna talk about that on-demand labor um, program. So I don't want this to be a commercial for variable, but I was exposed to this organization through a national partner and I love this concept. I understand it's fairly new and right now it's mainly in the urban areas, but it will be here very soon and there's so many other companies developing this technology. So this company variable is an IT firm. They created a technology platform that's similar to Uber, Lyft and DoorDash. So if you understand that business model, you're gonna quickly grasp this concept. Companies will often use this for special projects, seasonal demands, to augment their um, permanent hiring uh, situations and augment their lease staffing numbers since most agencies typically can't fill all of the hiring needs. And there's so many other reasons why companies use on-demand labor. But so why is it becoming so popular and why is it so successful? So this is an experienced workforce that wants to work, but it's on their terms. So how does it work? Simply, you post a job. So you post all the job details, the pay, the hours, the expectations, the requirements um, for dress or attire, the experience requirements you have, and then workers will bid on that position. You'll then select a worker who will come in and perform the, the job that you posted. People with experience will bid on this and you can select them based on their criteria or their ratings from other similar positions. You then just rate the worker, just as you would a driver or food delivery. And don't forget that variable contractor is also gonna rate you. So it's a two way street. So you're gonna rate them on performance, attitude, abilities, punctuality, um, and they're gonna rate you on things like, did, did you provide the training? What was the work environment like? How were they treated? So remember, it's a two-way street. They, they, they're they hopefully gonna get a good review and hopefully you'll get a good review as well. And over time, you'll begin to build a labor pool. You'll develop this pool of people and they may do other work assignments for you or if their employment situation changes, they may want to seek a more lasting relationship with your organization. So just like Lyft and Uber and DoorDash, these are independent contractors and your payment is made to variable. As I said, it's a tremendous, tremendously uh, growing um, growth market in the area. And I've seen some great case studies and testimonials. Yeah, that's that's a very interesting concept, Ken. And you acknowledge up front it's it's more in suburban areas right now, um, but certainly if it takes off, it, it will be here in Central PA before too long. Um, did I hear before that they're in Philadelphia already? Yes, are they, they are. Yep. Okay, that's the closest yeah. one. 
Um, no, and they're expanding all the time. And there's other IT companies that are coming up with this platform because it's it's technology based. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about onboarding. I want to talk about the onboarding as a process versus onboarding as an orientation event because they're very different. So good onboarding has a very real and direct impact on business economics. And there's some very good reasons that are very hard to measure and quantify of why you wanna have an onboarding process versus an, or an orientation event. Most of you will agree that proper onboarding is gonna reduce your turnover costs. It's gonna increase productivity and your new hire employees who receive consistent training. And much of this is built on having a process that's defined and not a singular orientation event that lasts a few hours, a day, or a few days, or any type of experience where you never check in with that employee again. It happens so often in the workplaces that I visit that the employee is just thrown out there to shadow with someone and never talk to again. So consider breaking down all the elements of your new hire training to include goals, timelines, and accountability aspects. Document those activities so you can replicate them again and again. Okay. Talk about apprenticeships. Those can be a great program um, to put into place at em employers to create a long-term strategy to, to uh, address this workforce shortage problem. So, Four main bullet points I want to hit here. Um, first being it, it creates a flexible and relevant training solution. It's an earn and learn as you go program. So not everyone is at the same place on the learning path. Also, because you're probably using a local partner for some of the topics of instruction, it's always kept fresh, current, and topical. It never gets stale or outdated. Apprenticeships have been known at tons of studies, they close the skills gap. Registered apprenticeships meet standards for instruction and experience, and there's a well-documented pathway of progression. Trained workers are more productive. Workers learn very transferable hard and soft skills in registered apprenticeship programs, and it's not hard to point out productivity gains of trained workers versus inexperienced workers. Lastly, these programs, apprenticeships, are an attraction and retention program for your business. These are employee benefits, and you need to remind your employees of the cost and the investment that both you and the employee make. But remember, it's, it's a benefit to both of you. They're gaining skills that are going to make them better um, and more marketable, and you're gaining valuable employees that are more productive and efficient. Colleges, tech schools, and training providers are making it very easy for employers to establish these programs. So, and there's lots of uh, federal and state grants out there to help offset costs for employers. So please consider apprenticeships as a solution to this workforce shortage. Next slide. Talk about benefits, performance management, auditing your your benefit offerings and making performance management meaningful. In this competitive environment, you should be evaluating your benefits regularly to ensure they're utilized and desired by your workforce. Applicants are comparing offers and scrutinizing plans, so don't give them any reason to go anywhere else. This includes all your compensation and group health insurance offerings, but don't forget retirement your vacation and PTO benefits and their respective policies. So why is performance management a topic in this webinar on labor shortage? Well, I'm so glad you asked. So a good program is gonna help management and human resources to properly identify the skill gaps and the team of deficiencies, thereby making recruitment and hiring more effective by hiring the right person the first time. Most of you already know that meaningful feedback between the employer and the employee, it gives insights into goals and achievements. It can help uh, resolve problems quickly and effectively, 
and it tends to have employees that have clear direction and expectations. Oftentimes, those are more engaged workers and they tend to be more productive and happy at work. And that means higher retention and lower turnover. Would you agree to that, Brett and Zach? Absolutely, yep. So let's, let's talk about retention. We talked about the trends of getting them into your organization. Now that we work so hard to hire our new employees, now we have to keep them. One of the most important things you can do, increase the chance of success with your employees, is to offer training opportunities and pathways for career progression. I talk to a lot of business executives and some like to argue with me that training is too expensive. They can't afford to send the people to the training or have them, or the, and they can't afford to have them away from their jobs to do the training. My argument has always been to those individuals and those companies is what is it costing your business to have those employees not properly trained and showing up every day, year after year? Training comes in so many different forms and formats now. Thankfully, thanks to the COVID, we have virtual training now and Zoom, and it's become a, a pretty regular format. But training can be on the job. It can be classroom style. We done with manuals and other self-directed platforms. There's videos, there's online programs, there's virtual reality and augmented reality, there's animation and simulation technology solutions. There's just so many things out there that employers need to use training now more than ever before and make sure that they're communicating that employer provided benefit to their workforce. Yeah, want to talk of, about career path. Yeah, go ahead. I was just going to mention on the training side, one of one of the more practical um, things to maybe take away from this webinar is we had talked a little bit beforehand, Ken, about the WebNet PA uh, funding out yeah. there for employers in Pennsylvania, where you can actually get up to two thousand dollars per employee to have them uh, go through some job skills trainings, and that's per year, right? So there's there's a number of different things that your employees could be trained on, but it's essentially to make them better at their current position or to get them ready for advancement in a future position. And I, from talking with you, I know Mantech has done some trainings which qualify uh, under the WebNet PA funding. I know Dale Carnegie does a number of trainings as well, which are approved through WebNet PA. So if, if you haven't looked into that source of funding before, and if, if money is a holdup, for investing in training for your employees. I'd encourage you to look into that. Absolutely, most manufacturers qualify. And um, it amazes me when, um, when I'm talking to manufacturers that they they forget about that resource or, um, or, or haven't looked into it in the past. So great reminder, Brett, thanks for that. Um, career pathways. So we have, um, I think Zach mentioned this, we have up to five generations working in your business right now. <clears throat> and one of those generations, highly motivated by career pathways. So I don't know if we wanna blame it on the gamification that's occurred in that generation. They've grown up with leveling up and everything that occurs in, in their sports academics. But the reality is clearly defined career progression is gonna help your business more than hurt it. That old school thinking of just do this for five to 10 years and you'll get there, that's no longer motivating enough, especially for the newest generation. It's just like their games and the apps that they spend lots of time entertaining themselves with. So please try to create career pathways or ladders for progression for your workforce. Yeah, and that ties in perfectly with what Zach was talking about at the beginning with kind of the, the generational difference in seeing manufacturing as a viable career path. Um, so to your point, if you can kind of lay out the, the progression within the field, I think that will be more attractive to the next generation. I want to talk now about culture. Culture is the glue that defines and holds the organization together. It is to the company what personality and character are to you and me. So I know culture is a touchy-feely subject. It's not often described in a meaningful manner. Um, some people don't even know what it is. So I help companies to define that by saying 
you know, it's a combination of values, beliefs, assumptions, and processes that are found in your day-to-day -day operations. <clears throat> so contained within there are the operational elements, like how does leadership communicate with employees? What's the level of respect among employees or departments? Is there trust and recognition of efforts and achievements from management? There's a whole bunch of other characteristics too. And we could spend a whole presentation on this, but we're not going to right now, I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole. But I'll summarize this by saying that a healthy or a good company culture has engaged and empowered employees who feel valued and appreciated for their contributions. I don't want you to overlook the trend that many organizations have begun to realize this and have put effort into defining and sustaining company culture. After all, if you can define it, you can measure it, and you can improve it. Some organizations will use tools and assessments or surveys like Gallup polls or programs like Best Workplace and PA or other types of employee satisfaction surveys to help them to define what their culture is. And that's great. So I'll simply end this slide by saying that culture trumps strategy every time and twice on Sundays. A healthy culture provides resilience in tough times, and we've had enough of them the last few years, haven't we? It's amazing what employees will do during times of crisis and incredible challenge to meet customer expectations. So work on your culture and have positive impacts on things like employee engagement, turnover, it'll lead to stronger brand identity, higher productivity among your workforce, and more effective onboarding. So with that, Thanks, I will turn it back over to you, Brett. Sure. And actually, as, as you were describing um, some of the strategies to promote your culture, it reminded me of one of the things we're doing here at McConley and Asbury. Uh, the la last couple of years, we started doing pulse surveys, which um, I think have caught on with a lot of larger organizations as well. But you're essentially sending out a very brief uh, survey every week, every two weeks to your employee base and just kind of monitoring those overall scores. Um, again, our survey, I think, takes one minute to complete. So it's very quick just to get a quick pulse on how your employees are doing from an engagement perspective, um, but then allows the management team to make adjustments um, much quicker than just an annual survey or something like that. So another option if, if you're looking into how, how to monitor employee engagement, maybe look into pulse surveys. So that brings us to the second polling question. Um, we're going to go ahead and launch that, give you maybe a minute here. So of the solutions that I'll list off here, how many has your organization used to try to overcome the labor shortage in the last three years? So here are the solutions. Um, utilizing temporary employees, targeting non-traditional employees, improved wages and benefits, focusing on improving your culture, or increased use of automation. So there were five solutions there in total. Uh, which or how many of them have you used in the last three years? And while we wait for the answers to come in, uh, Kent and Zach, I'm curious to hear from you, looking at the solutions that I just went through, um, which, which one do you think is most critical or, or maybe has the biggest impact on companies? So it's looking at temp employees, targeting non-traditional employees, improving wages and benefits, working on culture, or increased use of automation. I think if we're going to look uh, through more of a long-term lens, I think it, you know, it, it would have to be focused on improving uh, workplace culture. I agree with you, Zach, but I think the most immediate impact most employers have found addressing the labor shortage has been with the um, increases in salary, starting wages, pay, and benefits. It's almost table stakes, or it's been table stakes here for the last year and a half. Um, but yeah, some of those are more long-term. Yeah. So let's see the results. Um, pretty well split. Um, glad to see over 50% implemented at least three of them. Um, so that's that's encouraging. All right, I'm gonna move on to the next slide. So, so far, um, 
Ken's solutions that he covered are more employee-based solutions, right? So attracting new talent, uh, retaining the talent that you already have. I'm going to focus now on the non-employee-based solutions, and I'm talking specifically about two solutions. Uh, one, improving your processes, and two, investing more in technology and automation. So the first point is, um, as you look to the past three years, all the events that have transpired, you have been forced, no doubt, to adapt your processes. They've changed. We're talking processes for manufacturing, for inventory, trucking, your purchasing process. Um, lots of changes have happened, but the question is whether those are process improvements, their efficiencies, or are they just process changes that were necessary for survival? And I'll give you an example I think many of you will be able to relate to. So let's say that you've run out of storage space in your warehouse because at this point you have the highest level of inventory on hand as you're trying to avoid um, some of the disruptions in the supply chain. So as a result of running out of space, you start storing some inventory, some materials outside, uh, depending on what your materials are, that might be an option. And while that's certainly understandable for the time we're in today, that ultimately can lead to inefficiencies. Now, I, I've seen some reports lately that show the supply chain is maybe moving in the right direction, maybe inching along in the right direction. Um, but eventually there will be a time, hopefully not too far away, when you're gonna need to revisit this process change of having really high inventory levels and even storing materials you know, inside, outside, all over the place. So make sure that uh, a change like that, which is designed to be temporary, doesn't become a permanent change or a permanent inefficiency. The second bullet point is just meant to encourage everyone to look for ways to continuously improve and specifically to reach out to your employees who are in the warehouse, who are on the manufacturing floor uh, and empower them to come up with ideas to uh, continually improve the process. Um, I saw this recently at one of my clients where they uh, asked the employees on the, the plant floor, what would make your job easier? And they got a number of responses, most of which are pretty straightforward solutions that, that could be acted upon quickly. One brief example was um, an individual who was working in kind of the final inspection part of the process. Um, they noted that the lighting in that stage was was not ideal. There was some dim lighting. And so they they noted that and the manufacturer was able to go in, add another light fixture, which greatly improved uh, the process, right? The person doing that final inspection, it's easier on their eyes. They can do it quicker um, because they have better lighting. And it was a very, very inexpensive fix. N not to mention the fact that their jobs they're probably doing a better quality inspection as they get more lighting. So um, just encourage you to reach out to the employees who are on the plant floor and, and ask them what would make your job easier or maybe what issues are you seeing uh, out on the plant floor that are causing frustration across your team. So this uh, chart here just shows that this is this idea of focusing on process improvements it is something that executives in manufacturing are, are using to address the labor shortage. This just shows in the last um, eight months here in 2022, the number of executives that are relying on process improvements to offset the labor shortage has gone up from 56% to 63%. All right, and the next slide here, we're going to look at the need to invest in technology and automation. So I'm assuming many of you have already heard the fourth industrial revolution is here, also known as Industry 4.0. That covers a, a number of technologies. I listed out a few there. Um, you may have heard of IoT or the Internet of Things. You also see a lot in manufacturing um, IIoT, industrial IoT, artificial intelligence, 
uh, advanced robotics, wireless communication, and advanced uh, analytics. They're all kind of under this umbrella of Industry 4.0. So if I were to summarize, you know, what is what are the trends, what are the impacts of Industry 4.0? I'd say it's essentially getting much better visibility to data through use of sensors. That's a lot of the IoT piece and more interconnectivity across multiple machines as well as multiple devices. So at the end of the day, you're getting more data. Uh, really, you're getting better data, better visibility to data, and that allows your employees to make better decisions, which will then increase productivity. Uh, I mentioned here the results of a survey. This came out in 2022. Uh, this was a global survey with manufacturers, 500 manufacturers around the world, and it came back showing that nearly a third of manufacturers say that they have at least 31 or more robots within their plant, which I thought was interesting. And, and actually, I saw Amazon has over 350,000 robots across their facilities. So obviously, manufacturers have already begun to invest in robotics and automation. Um, we see there that the, the total industrial robots in 2022 are valued at $17 billion. That's expected to more than double just within seven years from now. Um, so this, is, this has been a trend. It's going to continue to be a, a trend because manufacturers are seeing that there are benefits to automation. And the next slide I'll, I'll show here just a few examples of those benefits. And then I'll finish with just maybe a word of caution as some manufacturers have run into um, maybe the downside of automation or over automation. So on this slide, I just found some manufacturers that you may or may not be familiar with. They've invested in technology, invested heavily in technology over the last few years and some of the outcomes of those investments. So I'll point out here the top one through uh, advanced sensors and sensor analysis has led to over 50% increase in workforce productivity. Uh, then you have the industrial IoT and advanced analytics increasing the use, or sorry, increasing the efficiency of equipment by 30%. You see Unilever was able to reduce their inventory levels uh, by 50%, which is surprising, again, given today's climate, but uh, impressive. And the last one I'll point out here at the bottom, just the reduction in energy consumption. I actually saw a lot of examples that I didn't include on here where more manufacturers, as they're weighing um, the benefits of looking into ESG and, and determining how much uh, they care about that, how big of an issue it is to them, um, more and more they're investing in technology to help reduce their carbon footprint or help reduce their energy consumption. Um, so there were actually a lot of examples of that out there. I just threw the one in there. All right, so at this point you are maybe convinced to invest a little more in technology and automation, but I just want to make a couple points of caution. The first one being that there is this kind of bad reputation with robotics, with automation, and I think it's important to recognize that the workers out on your plant floor may be assuming some bad things when they hear that the company is going to be investing more in automation. They may assume that means that their job's on the line. They may be terminated uh, because they're going to be replaced by robots, right? That, that idea is out there. Um, I would just say from the clients that I've spoken to and, and even speaking with my colleagues, that is not something we have seen. Uh, I know that has happened from time to time, but more often than not, um, the use of automation is really meant to bridge the gap. The, there is such a shortage already that you, you can't terminate your, your manufacturing employees. You, you need them too much. So it's, it's meant to kind of come alongside um, the the humans that are, are working out on the plant floor and really if if any of their job is being offset by automation that frees them up to do more challenging or more interesting work um, i've seen sometimes too where maybe they're reskilled to be in charge of that machine um, to keep up with that technology understand the technology and and if that's happening if you're being reskilled if you're doing more challenging 
work, that means that you're more valuable to your employer. And oftentimes that results in better compensation. So I think it's important if your employees are going to hear or see that you're investing more in technology, it's important to be upfront about how this is really a win-win for both the organization as well as employees themselves. And Brett, I think that's a great point. And I think it ties back into uh, uh, Kent's point about having a career path. You know, now this allows that line worker that was doing that same monotonous task for the last couple of years. It, it gives them a new new opportunity. It gives them, you know, some some pr promotion potential there. So it just adds a lot of value to, to that employee's career path. Yeah, that's a great point. All right, I, I want to finish here with an example, maybe as a test test uh, study on over automation. So back in 2018, Tesla set this lofty goal to manufacture 5,000 Model 3 cars each week. And for them, that was certainly a stretch goal. And in order for that to successfully happen, Tesla had to invest heavily in automation to the point where they automated uh, over 75% of their manufacturing process. And now in hindsight, the 2018 rollout is generally regarded as a flop, at least in the first several months, since for much of the year, they could only manufacture 2000 cars each week, as opposed to their goal of 5000 cars each week. And that was due to various steps in the automation process running into issues. You know, one step, something goes wrong, they have to shut, shut down the whole line. And so they just couldn't keep up with their goal. Um, so now Tesla's rollout of the Model 3 has become a case study in over automation. And it actually nearly led to the collapse of the company um, because they had invested so much money in this project and they were reliant on it working. So a, a quote from Elon Musk uh, with regard to the rollout of the Model 3 cars back in 2018, he said, excessive automation at Tesla was a mistake. To be precise, it was my mistake. Humans are underrated. I thought that was interesting. And, and again, goes to my earlier point about how it's not meant to replace employees. More often than not, uh, they come alongside employees. So there is a risk of automation. So don't make the mistake that Elon Musk made in undervaluing the role that humans play in manufacturing, even as you invest more in automation. And that brings us to the final polling question. As we consider future webinars and articles, which topic are you most interested in hearing about? Federal and multi-state planning, tax planning, uh, cybersecurity, transaction advisory, or Lean and Six Sigma? We'll give you a minute here to, to answer that question, the final polling question. Uh, I have to ask because my initial polling question, we ended up going a different direction, but Zach and Kent, I initially wanted to ask how many games Penn State football would win this year. Um, so I'm curious to hear your thoughts on that out of the 12 games they're playing. Well, see, the original options, there was nothing under 50%. So I, I think I'm going to have to abstain. I don't like that answer. Kent, anything better? Let's hope they win them all. There we like, go. you know, they're in a tough division. Yes. Yeah. All right. Let's see how we did here. So it looks like cybersecurity. Um, really no surprise there. I probably would have assumed that it, that's such a big topic impacting manufacturing more than most industries, honestly. Um, so great. We will look to get more articles, more content out on cybersecurity impacting manufacturing. So the last thing we want to just make note of an upcoming conference on October 5th, Mantech is putting on their smart manufacturing conference. Uh, some of us will be there, we'll be a sponsor as well. But the topic looks really interesting and that's why we wanted to, to mention it here. The topic is the future of manufacturing and the implications of the next industrial revolution. So if, if you're interested in learning more about that, you can go out to Mantech's website and look into that. I know there are going to be a number of interesting breakout sessions 
And I think the, the keynote speaker is the CEO of Future IQ. So should be a lot of, a lot of good content there. Um, Kent, anything else to add on, on the upcoming conference? Oh, you nailed it. Um, October 5th, be there. Great. There we go. All right. Um, I do see a couple comments have come in here. So maybe we can spend a minute looking at them, Kent and Zach, if you see them here. So the first comment yeah. I'm seeing, uh, massive layoffs and shifting of jobs overseas gives the perception that manufacturing is not long-term reliable work. Um, you get laid off with little notice. I think that is a really interesting point. And I'll be curious to see in the coming years, uh, we've seen a bit of a trend of onshoring again so I'll be curious to see if that continues, as uh, obviously a lot of the supply chain issues have been due to overseas issues, uh, countries shutting down it, and so on, just having less control over what happens overseas. Um, so it'll be interesting if, if onshoring really takes off and if that maybe gives more stability to manufacturing jobs. The only thing I'd like to add to that is um, that may be a misperception of you know, big company manufacturing. Um, I would think that probably 85 to 95 percent of the manufacturing in um, in our nine counties in South Central Pennsylvania is small to medium sized businesses, those with, you know, less than 200 employees. And I don't think they're as susceptible to those massive layoffs and that shifting of overseas um, work. So. Appreciate that. Um, last question I saw, is there any opportunity to leverage the millions of undocumented immigrants to relieve pressures in the labor market? Um, that is a big question. <laughs> and so I, I can't answer uh, all of that, but I, I will say, um, and this maybe doesn't address the undocumented piece as much, but I have talked to probably two of my clients who have leveraged um, the H2B program. Um, where they're getting a, a lot of help from immigrants on a seasonal basis, but I, I believe a season can be the better part of a year. Um, and so they've they've really filled in a lot of their skilled labor gap um, over the past couple of years by utilizing the H2B program. Any other? Yeah, um, I'm not an attorney, but um, I think if you were to hire undocumented um workers that might be a violation of some um ICE regulations and that might get you into some hot water but again there's lots of different sat statuses while um immigrants are um in transition or going for citizenship they can be in asylum status they can be in various statuses and um and they can be sponsored in some ways, but they do have to have some, uh, be in some status. Yeah, and uh, this is, again, maybe tangentially related to the question, but uh, we've seen a lot too with, with refugees who have been resettled. We, we have a lot here in, in Lancaster. Um, places like, I wanna say Tyson Foods has employed many of them. We've seen other manufacturers uh, around the U.S. who have really sought out um, hiring of refugees. So another good opportunity, depending on where you're located, for looking at maybe a, a demographic or a source of labor that you haven't looked to before. And Kent, the last question, does Mantech have solutions for a flex schedule or job sharing? No, not yet, but thanks for the uh, revenue idea. <laughs> all right well it looks like that is the final question so thank you for joining us for today's webinar if you have any further questions regarding today's presentation please feel free to reach out to one of us and we'd be happy to assist once again a special thanks to kent for his insight into today's topic a recording of today's presentation will be posted on our website and social media in a few days and for those of you who requested CPE and answered the three polling questions, those certificates will be sent out within the next two weeks. Thanks again for joining us and enjoy the rest of your day.